السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جميعا وأهلا ومرحبا بكم في محاضرة الـ OFDM المحاضرة الثالثة من دورة الـ OFDM للـ 4G والـ 5G والتقنيات التي ستأتي بعدها قبل ما نبلش في المح... قبل ما نبدا في المحاضره تذكير سريع في الاشياء اللي لحد الان ناقشناها وتعرفنا عليها ناقشنا وشرحنا الاو اف دي ام تقنيه الاو اف دي ام الفوائد الاو اف دي ام الترانزميتر ديزاين الريسيفر ديزاين كل الامور المتعلقه في الفيتشرز والكابابيليتيز والفوائد والسيئات والاشياء المعيقات لتقنيه الاو اف دي ام بحيث ان نحاول نبحث عن تق... عن ميثودز جديده بحيث انها تحاول تحسن تقنيه الاو اف دي ام وتجعلها افضل وافضل فاليوم في درس اليوم راح نكمل راح نكمل بالاشياء راح نكمل بالضبط من المكان اللي توقفنا عنده في المحاضره السابقه واتذكر انه توقفنا عند السلايد اللي له علاقه في التشانل كودينج في التشانل كودينج حكينا انه اتس فيري امبورتنت تو كونسيدر انكودينج يور داتا بيفور يو ترانسميت ذيم اوفر ذا تشانل لانه ال... لانه لم ترسل الداتا عبر التشانل عبر القناه الوايرلس بين الترانزميتر والريسيفر بتلاحظ انه في ال... 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 الريسبونس ال... رده الفعل تاعت التشانل ل... لكل سب كارير بتكون مختلفه من سب كارير الى سب كارير اخر فمثلا بنلاحظ انه في ال... في ال... في الريسبونس ال... مثلا الفيجر اللي مبين في الصورة اللي أمامنا منلاحظ أنه في عنا ثلاثة بوينتس البوينت نمبر 1 مثلا عندها هاي تشانل جين think of that as a filter يعني تخيل التشانل أنها عبارة عن فلتر فهذا الفلتر ممكن أنه يعمل amplification لل power or it can reduce the power of your data depends on the, on the response of the channel فمثلا النقطة عند النقطة واحد بنلاحظ انه الريسبونس جيد والداتا اللي بنبعثها عبر القناة اللي لوكيتد على نمبر 1 يو ويل هاف فيري جود كونستليشن دايجرام البوينتس راح يكونوا كلير سو ذات يو كان ايزيلي سيبريت ذيم اند ديتكت ذيم ات ذا ريسيفر بس ذا بروبلم فور اكزامبل وين يو ترانزميت يور داتا ات بوينت 3 بوينت 3 ذا ريسبونس اوف ذا تشانل از سو باد that when you transmit over it you cannot recognize that you cannot separate the symbols in the constellation diagram ما بتقدر تعمل اي فصل بينهم او ما بتقدر بتعرف انه هذا السيمبل اللي بعثتها في المكان الكوارتر 1 كوارتر 2 كوارتر 3 اور كوارتر 4 بناء على اعمل دي مابينج للبيتس اللي اللي السيمبلز حاملتهم فلحد فتوقفنا هو بعد فاتذكر انه بالضبط هنا توقفنا والان المحاضره ستبدا الاشياء الجديده راح ناخذها نبلش فيها من السلايد التالي ف اول شيء راح نحكي عنه اهميه الكودينج بالاو اف دي ام وشو التكنيكس المستخدمه بالاو اف دي ام ان اوردر تو انهانس اند امبروف اتس بيرفورمانس فاول تكنيك اللي هي الايرور كوركشن الايرور كوركشن كودينج اعتقد معظمكم سمع فيه او بيعرف فيه تقنيه جدا مهمه جدا مشان تقلل الايرورز نتيجه نتيجه التشانل والامبيرمنتس اللي بتحدث نتيجه عن النويز الادد على الداتا فببساطه عندنا انك لنفرض انه يو هاف ا مسج سيجنال يو هاف ا مسج سيجنال يو اند يو وونت تو ترانسميت ذيس مسج سيجنال ثرو ذا تشانل سو يو دونت ترانسميت ات دايركتلي انستيد اوف ذات يو ماب ات تو في كودينج وورد اند ذيس في you transmit it through the channel instead of you and the receiver receives vector r and this r it has some noise added to it 
and there is channel also convolved with it. Now, where is the where is that issue here? And that the vector u, the vector u, a bar on information sequence. The information sequence a bar on the data, the pure after you uh, after after doing source encoding. So let's say you have four bits, you want to transmit them. Instead of sending four bits as they are, you encode them to seven bits, let's say, seven bits or sometimes eight bits. And then instead of transmitting the four, you are transmitting the seven bits to, through the channel. And after that, noise will be added and the receiver, the receiver goal, had of the receiver and we are if mean a, 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 a code word V, a crop code word V estimated by the Bayinli, the actual data, the transmitter, or the receiver. So, the problem with the channel encoding is the performance of the bit error rate. بيعمل ال communication more reliable ولكن إيش ال disadvantages اللي بتحصل لما نعمل ال channel encoding ال disadvantage أنه إحنا لما نبعث بدل ال four bits نبعث seven bits عندك عندك inefficiency لأنه مش ال السبعة bits مو كلهم عمالنا بنستخدمهم مشان يبعثوا داتا ولكن بنستخدم جزء منهم حوالى نصف البيتس هاي بنستخدمها فقط لكي تخولنا وتمنحنا القدرة على انه نعمل ديتكشن للبيتس ونعمل كوريكشن فيعني عندك دق عندك بتخسر انت قاعد في الافشنسي اوف يور سيستم هاف يعني بدل ما ابعث فور عمالي ببعث 7 دات 7 بيتس اور 8 بيتس this is not efficient in terms of spectral efficiency, in terms of data rate, because the throughput in this case will be reduced. You receive, your, your information is just four bits, but you are receiving seven bits to get the four. This is not good. I would, I would like to have four bits equal four bits. But unfortunately, with the current coding system, this is the case. إيه المشكلة الأخرى المشكلة الأخرى أنه مشان أنت مشان تحصل على V لا لازم تعمل encoding process encoding process بتتضمن عملية matrix multiplication a little bit complex and this will increase your complexity and you are وأنت راح تعمل هذا الإشي مع كل الداتا اللي راح ترسلها عبر channel فبيعمل بزيد ال complexity وبزيد ال delay فصار عنا ثلاث three disadvantages دل encoding على الرغم انه مفيد الى انه عنده three disadvantages الاولى انه انه بقلل الثروبوت او ال data rate لاني انا عمالي ببعث bits زيادة ما بتحمل data فقط مشان ال error correction وال detection ثانيا بتزيد ال complexity at the transmitter and the receiver whatever you do at the transmitter you are doing at the receiver to reconstruct your data this we call it complexity and the first point is robot and the third point a delay if now the more you increase processing the more delay you will get فعنا كل هاي ال problems مع ال encoding ولسه عمالنا بنستخدم الانكودينج ف ف شيء مش افشنت الباند ويز اوف كورس الباند ويز لوس اتس اي مين باي ات ثروبوت ثروبوت واتس ذا ديفينشن اوف ذا ثروبوت ذا ديفينشن اوف ذا ثروبوت از ذا افكتيف ذا نمبر اوف داتا بيتس يو كان ترانسميت اوفر ذا ريسورسز يو هاف وات ار ذا ريسورسز ذا ريسورسز ار ذا باند ويز the bandwidth all the resources that's why we don't say bandwidth loss we say you are not utilizing the bandwidth efficiently the, you, the bandwidth is available always available this is the bandwidth but how efficient you are utilizing it this is why we say it, it it's better to say it uh, reduces the spectral efficiency or it reduces the throughput but the bandwidth is fixed we are, but the way you are using it, 
it, it it affects the overall performance now the question is this for the people who are looking for new research area this is a very beautiful research area you tell us that now we are in the 5g era 6g era everything we want it to be low delay with low delay extremely low delay extremely low complexity because we are dealing with internet of things devices and we want to utilize that robot very efficiently because the spectrum is already very crowded how how are we still using these complex encoding structures for example lte lte is using turbo coding turbo coding Turbo coding is very complex. Yes, true, you can get very high, very good bit error rate, but it's very complex process, very complex. And I, I noticed, يعني أنا أنا لم يعني شخصيا لم عندي السمارتفون بقدر أي واحد فيكم بقدر يحول الشبكة مثلا بدي يا على 3G أو 4G. لما تكون على 3G وتعمل سويتش على 4G quickly quickly your battery finishes. ال 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 يعني القدرة الطاقة الاستيعابية والطاقة الاستهلاكية لل ال تي اي لم تعمل رننج لانكودر زيها ما بيكون افشنت الباور نسيت اذكر نقطة الباور نقطة رابعة الباور الباور يا اوف كورس فور فور 5 جي they are using what polar codes but polar codes they are using it only for controlling channel why polar codes the good thing about 5 g polar codes is the fact that it reduces complexity i know polar codes and we will talk about it in a specific lecture but this this just to tell you why you should think in this direction so that you can think beyond what's there available in the literature and try to come up with novel techniques. Uh, polar codes, what, what's the motivation of polar codes? The motivation of polar codes, these four points. You have a robot reduction, complexity, delay, and power loss. I am consuming too much, too much power. Now, with the current turbo coding in LTE and Wi-Fi, you are using, what are you using in Wi-Fi? You are using in Wi-Fi LDBC. So another another type of coding. Both are complex. Both are complex. Now we are we are not in the 4G. We are not in the 3G. We are in the in new era that's not gonna use only the voice or the video or the uh, the the simple applications that we used to know. Now we are talking about Internet of Things. Now we are talking about everything being connected to the network. And these devices, they have extremely low complexity, extremely low processing capability, extremely limited power, extremely limited battery, extremely limited computational capabilities. And due to all these reasons, you have to come up with new code, new types of coding, new types of algorithms, new types of techniques that can avoid this such kind of problems. So I am just triggering your mind, triggering your mind and asking you if you have such a problem that you have this conventional encoding used in the literature up until now. Nobody, why don't we question it? Why should we keep using it while it's the hell is not doing anything towards the new advanced uh, applications like Internet of Things? So Bowler code is just one simple step, one simple step to solve this problem. But the problem is not resolved yet. The problem is not resolved yet. The problem requires you, requires your knowledge and your dedication and your hard work to come up with much novel algorithms than Bowler codes to solve this problem. So many people are saying that Bowler code coding and encoding algorithms are dead domain did research domain nobody nobody is anymore using it and you cannot improve anymore but this this is wrong why is wrong because this was made based on the assumption that we can use a block length with any a block encoding structure with with extremely high, with extremely large length so this is not the case anymore for future wireless systems. 
because you have short packets. How can you come up with a new encoding structure that can operate in short packets and give you extremely good reliability? That's the challenge. Bowler Codes is a new type of coding proposed by Huawei, by Huawei for 5G technologies. And the one who developed Bowler Codes is a professor in Bilkent University in Turkey. And he was with his team working and they wrote that. And it's the only coding scheme that can achieve the capacity of the channel. And the, the idea of Bowler Coding is very intuitive to the ones who know who know channel that what the, the, just let me explain the idea of polar coding in simple terms so that you keep remembering it and come up with better ideas in the future to show you how simple was that idea and it gained that much attention so the author of all polar code is saying that when we transmit the data over the channel, whether it's noisy or dispersive channel or whatever, you have some good channels and some bad channels, good channels and bad channels. So how do you determine the good and bad? The bad are the ones, if you transmit over them, you will not be able to decode your data successfully. While the good ones, if you transmit over them, you will be able to reconstruct your database successfully without any mistakes, without any error, without any confusion whatsoever. Now, he says, if, if, I, if, if my data, if I transmit my data over these bad subcarriers, I'm not going to get any, any data out of them. My data will be wrong. So why should I keep using them for a transmission? I will froze them, froze them. So... They, they, they will be all these these data all these subcarriers they will be frozen you freeze them and that you send only over the channels that are good enough so that you can send your uh, data reliably and successfully so this is the basic idea we don't want to just say that yes this technology was used in this but it's system the, 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 we, the most important thing is to understand the goal behind behind using that. The most important because if you know, don't know the goal and uh, the key motivation, the key triggering point that pushed the researchers to come up with such algorithm, you, you just randomly reading and memorizing things, but you don't know the purpose behind them, which is confusing and not gonna lead to anywhere. We are not memorizing here anything. We are not repeating anything again and again. We are thinking together. The point here, thinking together, I'm not teaching you anything. I'm just telling you what's there in the literature, what people are doing, what's the, what's the motivation behind all these techniques and why they are thinking to come up, up, to come up with techniques like this. This is the only, the only thing here was that's why the mentality should be innovative mentality and the questioning mentality. Don't believe anything until you do it yourself and execute it and know the reason behind it yourself. So now longest we got distracted a little bit by the subject of polar codes and these things, but let's return back to the main theme of the lecture. We have the forward error correction. I have, I have bought three lectures on convolutional coding and the block coding that I recommend you if you are not strong in channel coding and you want to strengthen your capabilities in that, I strongly recommend you to go and watch these three videos so that you can equip yourself with the tools and knowledge needed in order to develop new algorithms and techniques that can help you produce some much better schemes in the future. So it basically adds redundancies to the data stream, example convolutional codes, block codes that I have extensively explained in the three videos I will share with you privately. And then it mitigates the effects of bad channel. It reduces overall, th over, uh, overall throughput according to the coding grade K over N. So these are basically the, the ones we talked about. And we have also the ARQ ARQ algorithm, let me explain the ARQ algorithm. You have the transmitter here and you have the receiver, yes? So the transmitter sends the packet to the receiver. The receiver, unfortunately, for some reason, due to having bad channel, well, can, 
sometimes cannot decode the packet successfully. So in case he cannot decode the packet successfully, he sends a NAC message, NAC message to the transmitter telling him, hey, I couldn't decode my packet successfully. Could you please retransmit the packet again for me? So the transmitter in his protocol has the feature of retransmitting the same packet certain number of times until the receiver is able to decode it. So the transmitter resends the packet again to the, the receiver. So the receiver will have now two copies. Two copies, the receiver only needs to combine them effectively and efficiently so that you can, well, once you have two packets, you have more higher SNR, you have more capability, more probability of recovering your data successfully. So this is the thing. This is the, the point here. You have more capabilities of recovering your data successfully. Now, let's say the transmitter in the second back, the receiver in the second packet was not able also to decode his packet successfully. The receiver also asks, asks again from the transmitter to resend the packet. And let's say for uh, the transmitter is allowed to transmit the packet only three times, not more. What after three times, if the receiver is not able to decode the packet, it just drops it. It records error. You cannot decode that packet successfully because you have. Some, why is that? Because you have some limitation on the delay. Some limitation on the delay. You cannot. You cannot expect the delay to go to infinity and be okay with it because the applications, most of the applications, are delay tolerant. Now let me give you ask you one question for the ones who are really. Uh, they are expert in error control coding and they want to learn more. We have the fair, the fair word error correction, you can use it, or you have the ARQ. Now, if you are using, let's say, let's say you are using voice communication, which one of these techniques you prefer to use? You rather prefer using what? You rather prefer using forward error correction. Why? Because in forward error correction, you have your data here and you add the CB, you, you add the parity bits. There are parity bits, which are the redundant bits you add in order to protect your data and you send it through the channel. Yes. Now for ARQ, uh, this, so in, if you have voice communication, voice communication is very sensitive to delay. Yes. Video communication is very sensitive to delay. We use UDP, we call them UDP communication type of protocols. It, because of this, you don't have time to receive the data, then check, then check it, then decide whether it's correct or not, and ask the transmitter again uh, to, by sending NAC message to retransmit the packet and again check it again and read, ask the transmitter to resend again. There is no time for doing ARQ. So ARQ is not recommended to be used with applications that are very sensitive to delay. Now if you, so, so now this is the, for video and voice real-time communication we use usually forward error correction and sometimes hybrid with ARQ. We call it hybrid ARQ. You use both of them together. But you keep in mind that forward error correction is good for the cases where you don't have to, uh, sometimes for the delay sensitive application. Now give me examples on applications that are using ARQ. FTB, FTB, do you care about, do you care about delay when you are uh, transferring or sending uh, email uh, uh, file, uploading a file, you don't care about delay too much. You care mostly about reliability of the file. I want the file to be received to the server reliably. So that's why here the more important thing is the reliability, not the delay. That's why you can use ARQ. You can ask and keep retransmitting until your data reaches successfully. Another example, web, web browsing. Web browsing, you, you, you can use ARQ with it. Another example, email. Email, you can use ARQ with it. So the, the applications that, that can tolerate, uh, that can tolerate delay, 
you can use ARQ with them. The applications that don't tolerate, we use forward error correction. The ARQ mechanism, you you, you have your packet here, and after you, you, you have like cyclic redundancy check operation, this cyclic redundancy check operation, based on the data you have in your packet here, it operates on the data and calculates checksum here, checksums. Like you, you get checksum of length, let's say eight bits, so, and you send it to the receiver. At the receiver, you ch this checksum, you take it, this checksum, you, you, you operate on it. If there is any change on it, then you discover that there was some mistake, some errors to the in the packet, and you ask the retransmitter again to re to retransmit the packet again. Uh, you ask the transmitter to retransmit the packet again and send it one more time. Now, usually, you combine them with each other. You combine ARQ with the forward error correction, which is the case for for what? Which is the case for uh, LTE hybrid automatic repeat request. So these are the main points about coding. I will send you the three lectures dedicated to coding, the details of forward error correction and how to do them in convolutional and block error. So now, now we have these data bits. We have the parity bits here, read Solomon and or convolutional codes. And we have here the, you put the parity bits and map bits to the symbols. So you basically have the bits here mapped to the symbols and the interleaving, we know why we need to use it and the symbol mapping, mapping bits to symbol, we also know why we need to use it. And the I taught in the previous lecture, we mentioned that the bits, the bits, you map the bits in, in the constellation diagram I, I, I and Q. Now, once you map them in the constellation diagram, you basically define the phase and amplitude of each symbol in the constellation diagram. Phase and amplitude of each symbol. Great. Great. What does this mean? The phase, the phase and amplitude are carrying the they are carrying information of the carrier, of the carrier signal. The, the phase plays with the phase based on the phase of this symbol in the constellation diagram, the phase of the carrier will be changed. And based on the amplitude, the amplitude of the carrier will be changed. So, and you have I and the Q. You have the carrier on the in phase and the carrier on the quadrature phase. So these are the 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 points here. And you have we talked about why we need uh, shuffling. Why we need shuffling. Why we, why do we need to shuffle the subcarriers? We need to shuffle them to avoid the burst errors. You remember with me here burst errors. Burst errors here when you have deep faded channel and frequency selective. In frequency selective channels, we we usually use what we 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 usually use interleaver. Interleaver can work on bit level, can work on symbol level. So for avoiding the sucks consecutive deep faded sub channels we use interleaver on the interleaver on the symbol level okay so when you use interleaver your your channel you see this this is the channel yes when you use interleaver with your channel the effective channel will look completely random at the receiver what 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 do i mean by random there is no correlation whatsoever between the sub channels the, this there is correlation yes here there is correlation as you can see the subcarrier here is looks like exactly sim similar to the one next to it and to the one next to it to the one next to it and so on and so forth so the the to avoid the, this this correlation is very bad in terms of causing burst errors bulky errors and also in terms of receiver performance at the receiver side, what will happen? At the receiver side, you will have uh, the if you are using maximum likelihood operation, it requires the input for the operation. It requires it to be uh, completely random so that it works good in a good manner and give the expected performance. But otherwise, it won't. 
Now, again, what, what's th this figure is based the channel response, the frequency channel response. Now, from this figure alone, you can generate 100 ideas, 100 ideas related to how, utilize, how to utilize this for 5G and 6G and other technologies. Now, now one of the ideas that might, you might think of, you tell me uh, the idea of polar coding. Yes, yes, guys, the idea of polar coding that we talked about before a few slides. The polar coding scheme was designed. This is very important point. If you take it, you can generate patent out of it. The polar coding was designed initially for additive white Gaussian noise channel. And the author, the inventor, used some formulas based on better try uh, some formulas related to polar coding in order to determine within whether the sub channel is good or bad and he 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 deactivates the one that are bad the sub channel he doesn't transmit over them and only encode and send the data over the ones that they are good now this is how the polar code was designed based on additive white gaussian channel now we have frequency selective channel and we have time dispersive channel and time dispersive when you go to the frequency domain we have frequency selective and as you can see here as you can see here we have some sub carriers that are good like this point and some sub carriers that they are extremely bad yes or no so Obviously, if you, if you transmit your data over these subcarriers, you will be able to receive your data successfully and decode it properly. But if you transmit your data over these, we call them deep faded subcarrier, you will, you will not be able to receive them successfully. Yes? So, if I want, if I ever want to improve the bit error rate performance at the receiver, what do I do? I say, I'm not gonna transmit th these sub these deep faded subcarriers. I am not gonna use them for transmitting data to the to the, to the user that has this bad channel. I am gonna only use these good ch sub channels to transmit the data to that user. So what will happen to the data rate to the bit error rate? Suppose your bit error rate. Let's draw the bit error rate. The bit error rate is, the, let's the, assume we have this figure, this is the bit error rate, the y-axis is the bit error rate, and the x-axis is the signal-to-noise ratio, yes? So, the bit error rate, before you apply this algorithm, before you, the, it, it, it's something like this. Once you apply your algorithm, this algorithm of transmitting only over the good channels, you will get bit error rate like this. So you have improved the bit error rate by more than maybe 5, 6 dB, 5, 6 dB. You know what it means to improve the bit error rate by 5, 6 dB? And this means that you are kind of saving, th instead of uh, transmitting your data and reaching only one kilometer, now you can transmit your data and re reaches to two to three kilometer without losing any performance in terms of data rate or this. So this is amazing. This is very beautiful. And this, so now, now, as if you are, as if you have implemented coding, but you are not using any complex processing like generating matrix, complex processing, causing delay, and the problems related with the uh, conventional error correcting codes. You improve the bit error rate over a frequency selective channel without sacrificing much. Now this is one idea. The other idea, I am not using these subcarriers, I'm not using these subcarriers because they have bad subchannels, yes? So what would I do with them? Those sub those subcarriers are corresponding to uh, channel bandwidth resources. So if I don't use them, I will lose them. And I will say at that point of time that I'm not utilizing my channel bandwidth efficiently. 
So what 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 would I do now? What should I do? I should think of how to utilize these subcarriers by other user by some other means. So one way to avoid this problem is to look at the channel response of other users in the network. And if the channel response of the other users in the network around this over this these subcarriers is better you allocate this bandwidth to the other subcarrier who is experiencing better subchannels. This is one solution. The second solution, if you cannot know the, cha the, the channel response of the other users or it's complex and causing overhead to know the channel response of the other users, what should I do? I can use these bad subchannels. I am already losing them. I am already, if I transmit data over them, it will cause my bit error rate to be severely bad. I, I'm not benefiting from it. So what should I do? I can, I can use these subcarriers to, to perform some other functionalities that I like in the system. What are these functionalities? Like reduce the peak to average power ratio, reduce the out of band emission, Improve the security. Reduce the noise. Now you tell me, how can I do that? I tell you, for peak to average power ratio, to reduce the peak to average power ratio, what do you do in the literature? You use the techniques that I explained in the previous lecture. They are very complex. Some of them, they consume power, energy, complexity, and they cause too many disadvantages. They cause too many disadvantages. So now you have a new technique to reduce the big to average power ratio while you are improving the bit error rate. In the previous techniques I explained all of them, all of them, all of them, more than, there are more than 100 techniques in the literature for big to average power ratio. All of them, most of them, they don't improve the bit error rate. You are increasing the complexity, causing some delay, and consuming some unnecessary, and at the end, you are not improving anything. You just improve the bit, error, the, back, the bit to average power ratio. What if now I can reduce the bit to average power ratio and improve the bit error rate simultaneously? By, by how? By just making use of these bad subchannels. I don't, by not using them for data, I, I transmit over them special design signal, a special design signal that I, I don't need to receive them at the receiver. And the receiver does not, you don't need to change the receiver design or change the receiver structure by any way. And that's good for the, that's good for the companies that are designing these mobile phones. Yes? If you come up with a technique that requires significant changes in the receiver, in the smartphone, the companies will not buy it, usually, unless it brings too many advantages. So this technique, you don't need to change the receiver structure or cause additional too much complexity to it because all what you need is to tell the receiver that I'm not using these indices these subcarriers for data so whatever i transmit over them ignore it i i transmit uh, signals over these bad subchannels in order to reduce the big to average power ratio while improving the bit error rate because i'm not using them for transmission now the point is this here here where the you need to use your intelligence and cleverness in math you need to formula, formulate, build a, a, an optimization problem that can look. The, these are I, trans, I transmit over them over these subcarriers, quam symbol, quam symbol, quam symbol. But over these, I transmit a special design signal, special design signal. I am putting them in a different color. These special design signal, you design them. According to an optimization problem, this optimization problem, the goal of it is to reduce the big to average power ratio. How do you calculate the big to average power ratio? It's the maximum value in your signal over the average, yes? So you try the, the object, 
the, the, the cost function is responsible for decreasing the peak to average power ratio. By, by how? By optimizing this signal. Once you solve the optimization problem, you get these symbols that can minimize the peak to average power ratio. Now, is this the only idea? No. In OFDM to reduce the out of band emission, what do we do in the literature? What do we do? We, 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 we use windowing. And what's the problem with windowing? Windowing costs you spectral efficiency, it reduces the spectral efficiency of your system windowing. A windowing, you have your data symbol here, yes? And you have your CB here. So, and here you put some other filter, like smoothness to your data symbol, so that it reduces the out of band emission. So these are resources. These are spectrum resources that they cost you money. I can use them to do other things. I can use them to send data for other users. So basically, you say that I am reducing the I'm utilize I am reducing the out of band emission, but you are also losing a spectrum. So you try to solve a problem, you create another problem, and overall you 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 feel that you are not adding any new advantages. So for the peak to, for that reason for that reason, I I think utilizing these already bad subcarriers might be a good idea for also reducing the out-of-band emission. So you say instead of transmitting over these subcarriers, we can optimize them in such a way that I can improve the bit error rate and add some signals here so that it can reduce the out-of-band emission. The same for security. Add some signal to protect me instead of using the complex encryption and decryption. M many, many, many ideas can be stemmed from this. And all of them, all of them, they, ha they, they have some link, they have some link with polar codes, but polar codes is operating on bit level. And they are, but this is you are operating on symbol level. And polar codes was initially designed just for additive white gas and noise. Here you are designing for channels. Many, many great ideas you can come up with here, but you, you just need to give the time for them and innovate. I am revealing all and everything I have just for you to make sure that you can excel and do great things in the future just for you. And this, this video, this material is really, and the ideas, they are worth of really, really thousands of dollars. But just make use of them and know how to make use of them and connect with the people who are going to use them. I will show you where you can sell these ideas, yes? By the end of this course, I will show you how you sell these ideas, how to make money out of this. Not only science you make out of this, but also you make living out of this. Because everybody needs, if you help them, if you benefit them, if you do that. But of course, not to the wrong companies, not to the wrong people. We will not connect you with the wrong people and wrong companies who are trying to rip you off. So we will try always, always to guide you this by the end of this. You will learn how to transfer your knowledge, not only to something that's useful, I, of course, you will create some knowledge and some useful things in your life, but you will also learn how to market this, how to sell this to the people who are interested. Okay, we'll show you the process step by step. Now we are building your background. So here we are. Enough ideas on this. We can talk one day just on this figure, one day, one whole day, giving you new ideas, new ways of how to make use of this and save tons of monies for the companies by just pl properly playing and configuring these things. You need, to, of course, you need to have proper knowledge in the channel, not only OFDM transmitter and receiver design. So now let's move to the figure here. I already talked about this. I said this is related to scheduling when you have multiple users, user one and user two, they have different channels. You can 
You can allocate the good channels to the user, but this requires the knowledge of the channel of all users. So uplink symbol made of made up of multiple user signal number of channels to estimate number of user different user signal go through of course we know this that different user why different user signals go through different channels why that's the point why different user signal go through different channels any idea any idea because of the difference in their locations you have your antenna your transmitter and you have this user here and this user there i told you if there is a difference of lambda more than lambda over two lambda over two in a rich scattering channel each user will get different different channel than the other yes each user will get different channel than the other and due to having different channel now you have some flexibility to assign the resources. You know the scheduler that assigns the resources? You have flexibility to assign the resources according to the channel. And by doing so, you can increase the overall, the overall capacity of your network. And that's very, very useful and beneficial. Now let's go to the ranging in, in mobile communication systems. Now, usually in the uplink transmission, we have the, this problem that you have multiple users. A user can be in car, holding phone, or in a laptop, and all of them, they want to communicate with the base station. Okay? But where, where is the problem? The problem that each one of them has special distance from the uh, transmitter. Like, this is the... The laptop can be the, in circle one, mobile phone in circle two, a car in circle three. Now, you need, for this transmission, you need to consider two, two things, two important things you need to, tell, to take into account while you are accepting transmissions from the users. One, this user is farther from the base station. Therefore, for his channel to reach the base station, you need to increase his power. This user is closer to the, to the base station. For his signal to reach the base station, you don't need much power. For this user, this user is even closer to the base station. For this user, you don't need too much power, less power. So this process, we call it power balancing. Power balancing, you are balancing, you are optimizing the power according to the distance from the base station. Why? Because I told you distance has direct effect on the path loss, on the loss of your, on your power. Yes. So larger distance means larger loss in your received power. Now, if I want my signal to be decodable, to be recognizable at the base station, and I am very far from the base station, I need to send it with enough sufficient amount of power so that the receiver, the base station, can decode it. Now, if what's the problem if I transmit all these signals with the same power? Let's see what will happen if all they have the same power. All of them, they reach at the receiver, and th since this very far, by the time it reaches the receiver, this signal coming from the user close to the base station will be much, much larger than the signal received from the far user. So you don't see this signal, and you think that there is nobody transmitting. That's killing. So this is the first thing you need to consider while you are having multiple users communicating with the base station at, from different locations. The second point you need to consider is that you have different distances, yes? And therefore, you would need different time to reach the base station. If you allow them to transmit at, at exactly at the same time, you will have some interference, inter-user interference between all of them. This inter-user interference will cause inter ICI, ICI in your system, in your received signal. To avoid this problem, you, the base station talks to the users one by one and tell them, look, you are the closest one to me. 
Please start transmitting at T1. You are a little bit farther from me. Start at T2. You are a little even farther, very far from me. Start at T3. Okay. Then now T3 is the earliest, earliest time. So the first user starts to transmit this user. Then this, then this. In such a way that when they reach the base station, all of them comes on top of each other. They are on top of the on, they are on top of each other in time, yes, but they are not on top of each other in frequency, and that's why you can separate them in the frequency. This point is also very critical and very important to consider. And now, for the ones for the case for the case when we have an optical system, yes, we in before few days I gave a lecture about Li-Fi technology, visible light communication, and we said like even in visible light communication in Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, light fidelity, not wireless fidelity, light fidelity. We also prefer to use OFDM because of the attractive characteristics it has, the advantages that I mentioned earlier. So in that case, you have the binary data, you modulate them using BBSK, Kwame, Mikwam, and there is some multiplication by conjugate to make sure that your signal is real, and you insert the pilot's IFFTCB. As you can see, up until now, up until here, up until here, my friend, it's the same. Yes, it's the same as the other block diagrams. The only, the only difference here you have, so you you have here optical source like diode, and you have DC bias. We use the DC bias because we are in optical channel. the The signal should be real, non-negative, just unipolar, not bipolar. Unipolar means it's all positive. Bipolar, positive and negative. So to make sure that it's uh, unipolar, I add some DC value to the signal so that you, you you make sure all the samples are positive. And for the for having real signal, not not complex. They they does not deal with complex signal. Does not have like two <laughs> sine and cosine orthogonal to each uh, these kind of things. So to, to deal with that, you, you, you make sure that you have some here, some processing to get only real symbols. And at the receiver, you have channel, additive white gaps and noise, you have photo detector. Photo detector works like the, the, the optical, the optical source here, diode, and optical, filter, optical photo detector, they work as if they are antennas in the RF, Wi-Fi, we use antennas, but here there is no antennas. You, you use filters. So these are the factors that are really, and the remaining part is really CB, just like the other OFDM signals. So now you know these differences. And the, the, now for the implementation of I-50, we already talked about it in one of the previous lectures, but just this is to remind you th that uh, now, now I know I, I, I received a couple of questions saying, we, we, you, yes, we followed up with you in the derivation and how you showed us the relationship between symbols and samples and this, but still we are not very uh, clear about that. So I tell you that uh, I tell you that we can we I I will give you some codes. These codes you will not find them on the internet or anywhere. These codes are responsible for just explaining to you how you can see the sine and cosine from the I fifty and how you can see the relationship between the symbols and symbols. Because when you are in math, it remains math. Sometimes people might have some difficulty in understanding things with math. But everybody agrees that visualization is awesome. When you get, show me a signal, how it works, how do you get it, how does this affect it, becomes much easier to follow. 
So for that purpose, we'll, uh, we'll in one in one of the lectures, we'll try also to show you a, by a simulation, by MATLAB simulation, how these things work all together and see them practically. So now also in the after the simulation part, we will give you the parts related to hardware, how to build a transmitter receiver hardware from A to Z. You send video streaming from this point from your country to another country or from this point to another point without the need for any network. We'll, we'll, we'll teach you that as well and how to build it in a very cost effective manner. Like in, in less than maybe two, three thousand dollars, you build this transmitter and receiver design. How to build a base station? Base station, yes, base station, complete base station using softwares. Yes, so your code completely running on live, on, li on the air. And how th these are all thing and also will connect you with people open source projects globally related to big companies in the world i'm not talking about companies that are the vendors of uh, the, the ones who are like usually we don't they don't disclose anything to us we'll show you we'll connect you with those we'll give you id username password to join these projects see the real people what they are doing how to build base station in your town for example gsm network you build it by your own your own gsm network from a to z so all these things will connect them to the resources, but you need to give time for that. You need to give your heart and this, and and it's, it's gonna be very rewarding. So this is not only theory. This is not only something just explain the theory and math. We are making you strong in both theory and also practice, both going side to side. So here, for orthogonality purposes, we ha we have the symbols in time domain. You have the summation of all the symbols in frequency domain multiplied by the exponential basis function, and you have you have it in t continuous signal. But when you when you sample it and you sample it by considering this factor t s over n, where s is the symbol duration and n is the number of points in the i the i50 points and then in this case you will have this sampling and instead of t you will have ts over n and after uh, assuming that we already know that delta f multiplied by ts is 1 because delta f is 1 over ts or ts 1 over delta f so you get this equation that ba that basically represents the ID IDFT process. So this is to prove to you that this whole process after sampling is an IDFT process. And here also you can calculate the amount of interference ICI in case there is a shift or a drift between the subcarriers. You can calculate the contribution of the subcarriers to the ICI, as we explained earlier, just here with equations. And here it shows you the, the variable responsible for that shift that, co that caused that ICI level, this ICI. So all these are theoretical details you, you need to be aware of as well while you are building your system and giving you some ideas. Now, the second part of this is related to the OFDM system design. So we can, if you, if you wish, we can stop here, take a break for five minutes and then continue. Yes, we can stop here for uh, 10, five minutes and then resume, uh, take some rest, stretch yourself, do some exercises, return back refreshed so that we can continue excited and with more energy. Thank you very much and meet you after 10 to 15.
Hi and welcome everybody again. We are now continuing from where we left off. Now we will talk about the OFDM system design. And this is very critical, very important, very crucial topic that we have to be able to comprehend it and digest it and understand it very well so that we can map the parameters of the system to the requirements of the applications and network and the scenario we are trying to serve. So the main parameters in OFDM that we need to be careful about while we are designing the OFDM system are the number of subcarriers you have in your system. Second, the guard time and symbol duration. Third, the subcarrier spacing. Third, the modulation type per subcarrier and type of forward error correction, ARQ whether you will use adaptive modulation or not, all these important parameters you need to be, you need to consider them and be careful about them while you are designing. Now, the requirements of OFDM system, the parameters we have just mentioned, they are influencing the, the, the characteristics of the system in terms of the available bandwidth, the FFT size, the peak to edge power ratio, required bit rate, the delay spread of the channel, the Doppler values, the mobility, the desired range, the maximum allowed transmit power, the tolerable bit error rate, application, operating environment, and so on and so forth. All these are important factors that we need to consider. For example, FFT size and number of used subcarriers should be chosen by considering peak to average power ratio and total allocated bandwidth and desired data rate into account because increasing the number of subcarriers increases the peak to average power ratio, the bandwidth consumed, and the data rate. So we want the goal here to match to match the parameters of the OFDM with the requirements of the application or use case we have. Now, if we look at this picture together at this figure, we can see that we have here, we have here parameters for the OFDM. And there is parameters for the another waveform called filter bank multi-carrier. But let's focus only on the parameters of OFDM. And we have metrics, performance metrics that are being affected by the parameters you choose for the OFDM. This and this. These are metrics we care about. We usually try to improve in our design. Peak to average power ratio, robustness to time dispersion, also frequency localization, robustness to frequency dispersion. So what CP rate, for example, CP rate, how frequent you are using and inserting CP affects the latency and affects the robustness to time dispersion and affects the spectral efficiency and affects the time localization. Filtering and windowing affects latency, spectral efficiency, time localization, robustness, and frequency localization. Subcarrier spacing affects robustness to frequency dispersion, affects latency, affects spectral efficiency. Number of subcarrier affects peak to average power ratio, and also affects the complexity of the system. So as you can see, but the parameters have direct influence on the performances, performance of your system in terms of different metrics, whether latency, bit error rate, spectral efficiency, robustness to frequency dispersion, time dispersion, and the frequency localization. The goal here to understand these effects, these relationships between them, so that you can be able to design the systems properly. Now let's give an example, a design example. In, in general, in general, this is like 
very normal to see it's preferable to have as small carrier spacing as possible why do you need to have small subcarrier spacing because this gives a long simple period and consequently the relative cyclic prefix overhead will be minimized what do i mean by that when you have when you have large simple duration this is simple and this is large then the subcarrier spacing the subcarrier bandwidth is small when it's small when the subcarrier is bandwidth is small you can transmit more data per symbol more data obviously you can transmit more data per symbol you can transmit more data per, per symbol and therefore you can improve your data rate and improve your throughput but where is the problem when you increase the number of subcarriers the big storage bar ratio increases so you have two things contradicting with, with each other peak storage bar ratio and data rate when you increase the symbol size Data rate increases because the subcarrier spacing is shorter. You can put more subcarrier, but the big coverage bar ratio increases. You need to strike a balance between them. The other point, if you make the subcarrier spacing too short, too small, yes, becomes also very sensitive to Doppler and different kind of frequency inaccuracies or frequency offset, so on and so forth. Now, this is the, 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 this point should be taken into account while you are designing your system. The second point, while you are designing your system, if you make the subcarrier spacing large, what will happen to your symbol duration? It will shrink, it will become shorter. Now, when it becomes shorter, the there is a CB attached to the uh, CB attached to the symbol. This is the CB. Yes. The overhead of the CB will increase because the CB does not depend on the subcarrier spacing, does not depend on the symbol duration. It depends on the channel. So imagine you have a very very short symbol duration, and also the CB is short. Is, is relatively close to the duration of the symbol itself. So as if you are wasting half of your spectrum, half of your resources, not spectrum, time resources, wasting it for just the protection against multipath. So this is the problem when you have a small CB, a small symbol duration. But when you have large symbol duration, the overhead is small because this is the CB. The CB is fixed whether you are whether you are using large symbol duration or a small symbol duration. The CB is independent of the symbol duration. The CB depends on the channel, and therefore, the CB overhead when you have small symbol duration is more, which means you don't utilize your uh, system efficiently. But here you kind of utilizing it efficiently. That's the second point you need to keep in mind while you are designing your system. The relationship between symbol duration and, uh, and subcarrier spacing from one side and the CP rate and the overhead and the number of subcarriers and the big torch bar ratio, sensitivity to, to doubler and data rate. Also, if we want to design a system in the frequency 2 GHz, for example, 2 GHz lambda is equal to 15 cm. With, with terminal mobility V equal 200 km per hertz, we get a maximum Doppler frequency equal to 370 hertz because Doppler is equal to V over lambda. V over lambda. If we require signal to interference ratio to be 30 this gives us a subcarrier spacing of approximately 221.2 this subcarrier spacing is less than the coherence bandwidth of the channel for most channel including macro cells micro cell and pico cell the corresponding go of the symbolic duration in this case 
it it will be one over delta f which is this This is a very simple example and in a real design simulation there are other factors which must be taken into account while you are designing systems. So the environment is affecting you, doubler, dispersion, CP, signal to interference ratio, all these parameters are important ones to be considered. This gives you the power, this formula gives you the power of ICI due to doubler, how much interference is causing to your system. So that when you calculate SIR, the, the SIR is given 30. SIR is 30. Now you can calculate, this is equal to the power of the signal over the interference. The interference you calculated from this equation due to doubler and power once you know the SIR level required, you can calculate the power you need to transmit your signal with so that you get this SIR, which is really also very, very uh, intuitive thing you need to be aware of while you are designing your system. And the maximum time dispersion experience depends on the radio channel and its multipath properties. Yes, the maximum time dispersion depends on the multipath and delay spread. If, for example, we target our system for ranges up to 5 km, an excess delay of reflected and diffracted signal corresponding to delta S equal to 2 km is easily encountered. The difference between the two paths. So the excess delay is then delta S over C, the speed of light, which is equal to 6.7 microsecond. However, in rural area, excess delays of up to 20 microseconds can be observed. In this case, you will have a typical, let's assume a typical value of 20 microsecond. So you have, you, from this you can calculate the number of tabs that you have in your channel and accordingly design your filter or equalizer. So start with some initial requirements. You ask the user, the customer, that you want to design the system for him about the required bit error rate. Let's say he said more than 20 megabit per second. The RNS delay spread in the channel you calculated. Let's say you found it 200 nanosecond. And the available bandwidth that you can transmit over it, let's say it's 15 megahertz. And you have a Bico cell. Bico cell range is usually 100 meter. And you, cho you choose the guard time to be more than the delay spread. And the OFDM symbol duration as five times the guard time. So in this case, the, 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 the duration of the AFT is, kind, is equal to 3.2 microsecond. And the duration of the guard band is equal to 800 nanosecond. Now the subcarrier spacing you can calculate it by 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 just uh, reverse uh, by reciprocal of T FFT, which is equal to three hundred twelve point five kilohertz. If you have forty eight subcarrier in fifteen megahertz band, then you can you need sixty four point IFFT for modulation and demodulation. You can also calculate the doubler. The, the 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 power the, the interference caused by doubler according to the required signal to noise ratio signal to interference ratio and then the allowed one all these are parameters giving you a rough example of how to calculate things and how things are interconnected interconnected with each other and each parameter is affecting many other metrics and you need to be careful while you are designing them according to the need of the customer and the available system parameters and the application you are trying to serve also the modulation the coding rate the data rate uh, all these are can have direct influence into your data rate and your bit error rate and the other performance metrics like big coverage bar ratio and out of band emission. And here we can have a look at the wireless LAN. This is a practical Wi-Fi system. How the these parameters, the previous parameters I mentioned, most of them they are related to WLAN. 
Wi-Fi system in which you have the symbolic duration 3.2 microsecond the guard is uh, uh, the, the guard is 0.8 microsecond so the total duration is 4 microsecond and this is the physical parameters used to obtain different data rates for example if you the you have different options for data rate 6 9 12 18 24 36 48 54 and these data rates you can obtain them by using different modulations with different coding rates and and also the number of subcarriers here You you have you have FFT of sixty four. This means that you have twelve twelve subcarriers not used for data. These twelve subcarriers, where we use them, we use them for out of band emission. For example, these are the subcarrier of the OFDM, and here at the edge, at the edge of your OFDM, you don't use here. There are six carrier here and six carrier. You deactivate them. In order to reduce the out of band emission and make it below the spectrum, the FFT size, the symbol duration is given, the guard interval, the subcarrier spacing is 1 over this value 3.2, and it gives you the, the number subcarrier spacing equal 312. And the bandwidth you are allowed to use for your communication, the channel spacing and the frequency band and number of channels. All these are parameters used in the wireless LAN design to build your communication system. So coding across subchannels work best with with large delay spread. You have you can also use adaptive loading for improving your performance. What do I mean by adaptive loading? If you if your channel you have two subcarriers. And you have two subchannels. This channel is better than th this channel is better than this. Then in this case, what do you do? You you put on this subcarrier. You put high. You put higher order modulation like sixteen equam or sixty four equam. While for this you put four equam, uh, QBSK or PBSK. Okay, PBSK. So in that case. According to the response of the channel, you reduce or increase the modulation order so that you can decode successfully at the receiver. More bits per symbols where signal to noise ratio is sufficient. You can when the signal to noise ratio is high, which means that the channel is good, you increase the number of bits per symbol, and it also could also adapt transmit power in each subchannel. For example, if you have two, these two you have these subchannels in your th these are the subchannels and you have four subcarriers you want to transmit them over the channel so since these two subcarriers are corresponding to good subchannels you keep their power the same but these subcarriers are corresponding to low low subchannel gain therefore you can increase their power a little bit to compensate for the defect in the channel you can also use reliable feedback channel and accurate channel information to estimate the channel and utilize it for a frequency equalization and coherent detection so these are very important points as well and here you have the OFDM modulator and demodulator, we already discussed it. And here we give a brief comparison between the TDM, CDM, OFDM in times of in, in terms of timing, timing synchronization, frequency synchronization, timing tracking, frequency tracking, channel equalization, analog front end. Analog front end uh, includes automatic gain control, power amplifier. V, uh, and VCO voltage controlled oscillator and also in terms of fade margin region reuse capacity forward error correction variable bit support spectral efficiency so if we need to go or, or if we need to explain this table in details one by one we we would need a day 
or even more especially because these parameters they are affecting the performance directly but the point here that I want to make is that OFDM OFDM waveform is chosen in many systems and many technologies like Li-Fi, Wi-Fi, 4G, 5G and the ADSL, VDSL optics due to their characteristics and features that are beating the other accessing schemes like TDMA and CDMA. In all the aspects, in most of the aspects, OFDM is better than them. That's why we, cho we, we chose it as the, the modulation scheme or the transmission method to be used in these technologies. Now, this is, this is now we are done with the OFDM conventional design. Yes, the one that was used in 4G and the other systems. Now we need to have a look at the OFDM in the 5G networks. I mean, when we are in 5G, what are the differences here? What are the new things that we need to consider? People spent years studying modulation, trying to come up with new waveforms for 5G and so on and so forth. But at the end, what did they make? What did they produce? What changes they made? For on OFDM to make it suitable for 5G. So the point, let me summarize it for you here quickly and we will go to the details. Now, now here we have the, the researchers, they started in 2000 researching on 5G on 2010, around 2010. Yes, 2010, they started doing research, getting funding from the governments, from industry, this in Europe, in US, in China, UK, Japan, all these countries. Now, they, 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 all of the, they know that in future networks, we have the Internet of Thing devices, we have the massive machine type communication devices, critical internet of things, ultra reliable internet of things. So it's, it's, they came up with the conclusion that you have different requirements due to having different applications, yes? And they, they, then they, when they checked the OFDM that was used with uh, LTE, they found out that it cannot satisfy all these requirements, yes? Because you have so many use cases for it, oh, 5G. So to, to, to solve this problem, researchers started thinking and it, trying to innovate and come up with the new waveforms that can meet the requirements of Internet of Things devices and the other applications as well. One time we summarized them until three use cases in enhanced mobile broadband where you have a high definition real time video streaming and real time gaming and th these applications that require high data extremely high data rate one of the application is cloud computing where you don't have you don't need to have a phone or pc you just everything on the cloud you just interact them with your eyes and finger so now Enhanced mobile broadband, this is the point. And the second one is uh, massive machine type communication, which is related to Internet of Thing. And you have a thousand, a million of devices connected with the base station and you have ultra reliable low latency. You need ultra reliable communication, very good bit error rate and low latency. As you can see, the requirements are different and there is, they found out that there, you cannot find a single technology that can meet all these requirements, but they started studying different waveforms. So one of the waveforms they came up with is filtered bank multi-carrier waveform, then filtered OFDM, and then UFMC, and then unique word OFDM, and then zero tail DFT spread OFDM and 
GFDM, Windowed OFDM, and many, many other waveforms that have been proposed in order to solve some of these problems and to make sure that they can meet the requirements. But uh, no, no, be, most of them, yes, they. They, they introduce some advantages and merits, but these advantages come at the expense of, of, of some drawbacks and uh, some uh, like drawbacks and impairments and disadvantages that we don't prefer and like to see in our systems. So after that, they found out after extensive design that OFDM is a waveform that can be made flexible enough to satisfy most of these use cases. Yes, after maybe 10 years of research, we, they came up to the conclusion that you can modify OFDM instead of trying to invent a new ones here. We can modify the OFDM in such a way that it can, it can handle these services, these new services. Why they preferred OFDM? Because OFDM is already being used in the 4G network, used in the mobile smartphones, and we don't need to rebuild the network from scratch. We can build on top of it, just change these things using software or some simple hardware, and continue upgrading the 4G network to the 5G network. So that was the mentality, and they, in 2018, 2019, they adopted OFDM as the waveform for 5G. Now, OFDM, not the conventional OFDM, what they adopted is OFDM with different numerologies, a new term called numerology entered to the, uh, to the table, to the research domain, research area. And what do we mean by this numerology? Now we will explain this so that you can understand it better. So here, here the, the numerology, think of it as the subcarrier spacing of in OFDM. The subcarrier spacing in OFDM. In LTE, LTE was using this. Delta F is equal to 15 kilohertz. Only this. This is LTE. This call, this row is LTE. One use case, we need to increase the data rate as much as we can, improve the, improve the experience of the user in terms of internet speed, and they were using this. But now, in 4G, in 5G, they introduced OFDM uh, waveforms with different subcarrier spacing. So you have Subcarrier spacing of 15, subcarrier spacing of 30 kilohertz, of 60, 120, 240. Now, based on what I can choose these, based on the requirements of the user. So, for example, one resource block here when you have a 12 subcarrier, 12 subcarrier multiplied by 15 equal 180 kilohertz. In the case of numerology, we call this numerology number one. This numerology number two, when you multiply 30 multiplied by 12, you get 360 kilohertz. And numerology number three, 60 multiplied by 12, 720. The more the 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 more you increase the subcarrier spacing, the more bandwidth you will use. And this, this subcarrier spacing has direct influence on the symbol duration. Yes? Let's see how it affects the symbol duration. The symbol duration is something like this. When you have, when you have subcarrier, when you have small subcarrier spacing, the symbol duration will become large and wide. When you increase the subcarrier spacing, the symbol will shrink lower. So this numerology number one can correspond to this. Numerology number two corresponds to this. Why? Because you have larger subcarrier spacing, smaller symbol. Larger, even larger, smaller. La 
larger, smaller, larger, smaller. What, what, what other changes you see here? Not only the duration, but also the power. The power. Why do we have this power? Now think with me. All of us, let's focus on this example. You have, you have the subcarrier. Let's take two examples. Subcarrier, small subcarrier, and short, uh, wide subcarrier. Now, what's the difference between small subcarrier, narrow subcarrier, and wide subcarrier? Narrow subcarrier, you have in 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 the time in the frequency domain, you have a smaller bandwidth, and and since we assume that the amount of energy under the carrier is the same for narrow and wide, then this carrier will have a higher amplitude higher power kind of and and this will have wider bandwidth and lower amplitude because the energy under the curve is the same now what will happen to the symbol when you have uh, narrow subcarrier the symbol will be large yes and when you have wide subcarrier the symbol would be small. So now we have the opposite. We have short symbol duration for, for the wide subcarrier. This is wide subcarrier. This is narrow subcarrier. And we have large symbol duration for the narrow subcarrier. Now you can think and say, if the subcarrier affects the symbol duration, then this can fit and be useful for the low latency applications. Yes, because your symbol duration is small now, is very small. So you can make this case for the, the services that require low latency because you can quickly send the symbol. It's, the duration is shorter. What are these applications? For example, if you are using remote surgery, if you are trying to do remote surgery operation or controlling the drones or uh, industrial automation or any of these critical services that require low delay or especially for uh, vehicle to vehicle communication or um, self driving cars. Any, any delay can cause an accident, so it's better to reduce the delay as much as you can. So to reduce the delay, you need to increase the subcarrier spacing, the subcarrier bandwidth. And this will reduce the data rate a little bit and reduce the peak to average power ratio and increase the CP overhead. But this is how you can serve that use case, low latency. However, if you have a user that requires really very, very high data rate, then you need to, to send many narrow subcarriers and these, since they are narrow, you, 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 will, you will have large symbol duration, which means you will experience some delay. So this is good for, let's say, this is video streaming, and this is for self-driving cars. And here is the catch. When you increase the subcarrier spacing, the amplitude here decreases, but the amplitude in the time domain increases because it's energy, it's about energy. The energy in the frequency domain is the same as the energy in time domain. Parseval theorem, you confine, you, 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 you don't lose the energy, it's the same. So if, 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 if the amplitude is here very high and you squeezed it in one domain, in the other domain it will spread and the amplitude will reduce. If you reduce the amplitude in frequency domain, the amplitude in time domain will increase to compensate for the power and have the same energy. So now you will ask me, what if there are two users in the network and one asking this service and the other asking this service and you need to put these two users, schedule them adjacent to each other and serve them simultaneously. What will happen? Here is the trick. 
So here is the case we are talking about. Here you have user one, user two, this user using white subcarrier, this white subcarrier, while this is using narrow subcarrier because this white subcarrier because it, it's using self-driving car, for example. You reduce the latency. You need to reduce the latency. And this user is narrow subcarrier. Now, now, based on this fact, based on this fact, you tell me which user his subcarriers have larger power. This one, the narrow, the power of the narrow is larger than the power of this. Why? Because the, the bandwidth here is smaller. Since you, the amount of energy inside under the curve is the same, then the more you shrink it, the more it will go up. So when you put them next to each other, they will look like this. This is for user one and this is, sorry. This is for user one and this is for user two. So the amount of energy here, it's the same for both. But for the second user to have the same amount of energy, you need to increase the power. This is math, this is physics. Therefore, you will have power offset between the two users in the frequency domain. Now look what will happen in the time domain. In the time domain, this will have shorter symbol in the time domain, shorter symbol duration, and here larger symbol duration. So what will happen here? Here, this shorter symbol duration will have larger power, so you will have this in time domain. In time domain, you will have something like this. Now, this narrow subcarrier corresponds to wide symbol duration with lower amplitude to reduce the amount of power and have the same energy. And this now reduce, increases the amplitude of the symbol and reduces the period. And this causes also power offset in the time domain as well. And this power offset can affect the, inter can affect the interference between them and the orthogonality as well. So now also you keep this in mind while keep this in mind while you are understanding this system and trying to design. This is very critical important point. You don't need to forget it. The relationship between time and the frequency, power and time, the relationship between time and the frequency, power and frequency and time how they are affecting each other when you increase the subcarrier spacing and reduce the subcarrier spacing. This is one point. The other point now, when you increase, when you reduce the subcarrier spacing for a, for a user who wants high data rate or high speed internet, you need to use many, many subcarriers like hundreds, thousands. This many subcarriers will, since you are using so many subcarriers, you will increase the peak to average power ratio in this. So this will have high peak to average power ratio. For the other user who's not using uh, too many subcarriers, only few subcarriers in order to reduce, uh, because the application is just using low number, does not require uh, too much data. It's just controlling the information. You need to control the car remotely or you are controlling a machine or something and you increase the symbol duration. In this case, the symbol duration will be very short as I, so, I show you here, very short. And since it's very short, the CB, the CB can be as, as, long, as large as the symbol itself. So the overhead will become very, very large. So you reduce the spectral efficiency kind of. So uh, this is also another point you need to keep in mind, the peak to average power ratio when you use too many subcarrier and the, and what here, the CB overhead, when you reduce the CB duration of the symbol, this is symbol, uh, and it's related to the data, but the CB is not related to the data, the CB is related to the channel. The channel, let's say the channel says use 
for microsecond you use for microsecond so the overhead is large and the same this is for the for the downlink you have you, you put these signals together and you get a composite signal so these the ones i draw here they they look like one signal so in time domain they are on top of each other here one signal goes to all users and each user get his own signal in the uplink however also the two users send their signals and they reach the receiver as a composite signal then now you tell me they they reach the receiver on top of each other i tell you yes but you can separate them in the frequency domain because they are multiplexed in the frequency domain so this is very important and critical point while you are trying to understand the differences between the OFDM used in LTE and the OFDM used in 5G. Now, what about when you put the when you when the when the base station sends the signal to two users simultaneously, but these two users are asking two different services, and therefore you need to use two different numerologies. One is using, let's say, this example, one is using 30 kilohertz, while the other is using 60 kilohertz. This for low latency and this for high data rate uh, application. What will happen in this case? Narrow sideband. In this case, as you can see here, this wide, wide subcarrier will cause interference to the subcarrier that has lower subcarrier spacing and this is the interference value when you draw it so you will create inter intercarrier interference between them and since it's coming due to changing the subcarrier spacing we call this interference the new type of interference we call it INI inter numerology interference so this is one of the challenges when you are in in 5G and you need to be aware of so that you can hopefully come up with techniques that can overcome this. Now one of the technique to, one of the technique to overcome this is to put guard bands between these two numerologies. You you separate them away from each other and you put guard bands so that you reduce the interference. But the guard band is costly. Why it's costly? Because you buy it from the government and you pay lots of money for it. Okay? It's very costly and very inefficient to keep using it. So, therefore, therefore, we need to come up with different better solution that can minimize the guard band while reducing the interference between the numerology now this is the, this shape in the frequency domain in time domain they look like this you have one signal here and this signal is composed of this of the narrow side narrow subcarrier numerology and white subcarrier numerology the white subcarrier numerology since the subcarrier is wide see this this white subcarrier here is corresponding to this white subcarrier corresponds to shorter symbol duration and this is the cb of course while for this smaller subcarrier the symbol duration is larger and the cb is this then you you in time domain they add up on top of each other but they are separating the frequency the OFDM signal looks like this you send it you send it at the receiver for user one for the for wide subcarrier numerology the FFT size is half of the original FFT size for the first sub for the other numerology so so this means that you need also to change the receiver design as well the fft size cannot be fixed all the times and the same you need to yeah yeah of course there is no orthogonality here when you bought when you bought the subcarriers uh, with different numerologies adjacent to each other there is no orthogonality but there is no other way to solve it except you come up with a new better algorithm to reduce this orthogonality this orthogonality you basically you basically put guard bands what i mean by guard bands here you 
you introduce here some guard bands. So you shift this there and you shift this here and you put guard bands so that the amount of interference coming at this symbol is lower. So this is the the important aspect. This of course here here where the research is going on in the literature. Researchers are trying to re how can you multiplex two different numerologies with two subcarrier spaces? while reducing the amount of interference and maintain their orthogonality which is really not up until now it's not very clear so one of the suggested solution to solve this problem is to be the guard band you redesign it in such a way that it's aware of this interference and make use of it or you use uh, modulation schemes that do, do not require activating all the subcarriers simultaneously. Or you come up with a technique that can calculate the amount of interference at each subcarrier. You can calculate it. Yes, you calculate it. Let's say you calculate the interference on this subcarrier. As you can see, the interference is coming on the odd, on the even subcarrier. The odd they don't have. This subcarrier, no interference, but the interference is coming only on this. And then this does not have. Then it comes on the fourth one. So one subcarrier with interference and one without. Now you can come up with a solution like this. You can say, I can calculate the amount of interference here affecting the subcarrier. And the amount of interference here affecting the subcarriers. Let's say I found it to be some value, R, R or whatever. Let's say you found the amount of interference here, you call it R1, and the amount of interference here, you call it R2. And you try to design a signal that can be added to the, uh, to the data signal in such a way that when it gets added, it can cancel the interference here, subtract it totally. This can be one of the solutions, but how efficient it is and how how practical this solution might be, we need to investigate that and simulate and test. And of course, you need to have some strong math in order to be able to deal with these transforms. So these are the numerology and supported channels in 5G and the OFDM symbolic duration and the sampling time for symbol time and CP time. So the parameters here, as you can see here, you have here the different numerologies. All of them with different subcarrier spacing, the CB type, and whether it support the physical downlink share channel, physical uplink. These are names for the channel that you are using to send your data. So the, these numerologies can be used, the others cannot. These channels for synchronization, primary synchronization, secondary synchronization, and these for random access channel. So all these are important parameters to consider while you are designing your system. And the frame structure in 5G is different than LTE. This is this frame structure. LTE, as you can see, LTE is part of the 5G. Part is one LTE system is only one case of 5G. 5G is adaptive, uh, adaptive system, flexible, can be changed according to the requirements. And here you can see one radio frame is equal to 10 subframes. 10 slots, which is equal to 10 millisecond. Each subframe is equal to one slot, one millisecond. And in each one slot, you have 14 symbols. So this is for the case of 15 sub 15 kilohertz. Now for the, for the case where you have 30 kilohertz, the one subframe is equal to two slots and equal one millisecond. And one slot is equal to 14 symbols. So as you can say, you can, the frame structure changes according to the changes in the subcarrier spacing because it affects the number of slots you have and it affects the total number of OFDM symbols you have in one frame.
the waveform in, in, in 5G, the waveform in downlink, they consider it to be CB OFDM, which is similar to, to LTE, but with different subcarrier spacing. In the uplink, they considered either you use DFT spread OFDM or CB OFDM. The DFT spread, the only difference here, you are using a trans, a, here kind of another transform in order to improve the peak to average bore ratio, reduce it. So this becomes single carrier. But now this is the difference from LTE. In the uplink, in the LTE, we only use this. But in 5G, we can use also this in the uplink, but try to reduce the, the peak to average power ratio. Now, one might ask, why should we keep, why, why should we use CBOFDM in the uplink where the peak to average power ratio of OFDM is higher than the DFT spread OFDM? I tell you because in the future, the mobile devices will have MIMO, MIMO. And CBOFDM is compatible with MIMO and user-friendly with MIMO, while DFT spread OFDM is very difficult to integrate it with MIMO because MIMO requires that each subcarrier have uh, each subcarrier experiences a uh, flat channel, and that's very important point to consider. That's why they considered CBOFDM in the uplink as well. And we can, these are the important uh, information, rough, this is very brief summary about the exact key differences between the physical layer in 4G and 5G and the changes to the frame structure, to the waveform in uplink, downlink, and the new numerologies they are using and how it's affecting the whole system and how changing the, just the subcarrier spacing can affect the power offset, can affect the symbol duration, can affect the overhead, the big tower battery, all these parameters and therefore make them adaptable based on the adjustable according to the application you are targeting to serve. So for this we can stop here for today and we can continue next lecture, inshallah. Thank you very much and 